I built this liquor cabinet using the little Castle 100 pocket cutter. And in this video, I'm going to show you not only how I built the cabinet, but how I used this little machine and the Castle pocket to make it all come together. And as a bonus, I'm going to show you how using the Castle pocket is easy, cool, and it can be used as a design element in your projects. So check it out. There are quite a few parts in this project that have different sizes, so I had to spend a fair amount of time ripping everything to length and width. I wanted to use that knot there, so I'm getting it laid out so that can be included in the project. And I continue on ripping these parts for the top and the bottom and the sides and the rails and styles for the door. This is white oak. I've already planed this to dimension. And once I get all these parts ripped to size, I can move on with the next part of the project. There's two permanent shelves in this cabinet, so here I'm cutting dados into the sides. I'm holding a spool board behind the workpiece so it doesn't blow out the back when it runs through the blade. I'm cutting them about a quarter of an inch deep, which may be a little bit overkill. You really don't need that much in order for the shelves to be held securely in place. I like to do an initial sanding on everything before I get it all put together. It's an investment in time on the front end, but in the long run, it seems to make everything a little more efficient and easier. This is the Castle 100. It cuts a really sexy low angle pocket for pocket joinery. To use it, you insert your workpiece into the throat of the machine and secure it in place. When I pull on this handle, it actually raises a cutter into the material and cuts the pocket. Then I follow up with the drill through the drill guide to drill the pilot hole. You end up with a professional six degree low angle pocket. And rather than trying to hide these pockets, we're going to use them as an opportunity to create a design element in the cabinet. A little glue never hurts anything, but it's really not necessary. These pockets create a very strong and stable joint. This is an off the shelf clamp that I just modified by clipping the end off on a bandsaw. You could use a grinder or whatever but it works really good in this pocket and it's a lot cheaper than the alternatives. Since the glue is still a little bit slippery, I go ahead and follow up with a large clamp on top just to keep everything in place and exactly where I want it to be. Now the fun part, I'm just laying the screws to it. I'm using a high quality pocket screw, the kind that you really can't buy in the big box stores, but you can order them from Castle or other places online, but they really do make a difference in terms of ease of use and holding power. With the shell of the cabinet assembled, I give it the corner to corner check and everything is perfectly square and looking good. Moving on, I start building the doors and here I'm cutting pockets into the rails of the door frames. I'm cutting two pockets on each side of the rail. The exposed pockets are going to create another opportunity for us to create a really cool design element. I'm using a half inch Forstner bit to cut two evenly spaced pockets on the top and bottom rail of the door frame. These pockets will accept the metal bars in the doors. The metal bars have to be cut to length and I'm doing that on a bandsaw. Then I give them a real good cleaning with acetone to remove all the oil and grease. Birchwood Casey M24 Antique Black is a solution I use on a lot of projects. It will immediately change the color of clean metal. It's not really a stain and it's certainly not a paint, but it will immediately patina the surface of the metal and it will be durable and unlike paint, it'll be permanent. Building the doors is where the project starts to come to life. I get one rail put together and then I stand the door frame up 
so that I can install the metal bars in the pockets that we drilled earlier. Then I take the top rail and I have to beat it into place because it's, it's pretty tight and go ahead and screw the entire door frame together. Then I give it the corner to corner check to make sure everything is square and it was perfect. These are the castle wood plugs that we're going to use. These are walnut. Now we're not going to use these to hide the pockets. We're going to use them to accent the pockets. To install the wood plugs, we're going to put some glue around the opening of the pockets and lay the wood plugs in and gently tap them into place. The plugs are going to stand proud of the pocket, so I take a flat saw and remove as much material as I can, then follow up with a sander with a 120 grit sandpaper, and then just sand them smooth. The thing about the castle wood plugs, and everyone may not agree with me, but I think it's something that the average client, the average non-woodworker, would think is a sexy and unique inlay. They wouldn't know what is underneath the plug. You'll see what I'm talking about when I get some stain on this. I really like the wood tone you get on white oak when you use dark walnut and Danish oil and that's what I used on this project. This is where you can see the wood plugs start to stand out and really pop and look unique. The back panel of the cabinet will be shiplapped maple, so I had to prepare the lumber by cutting it to length dimensioning it to half an inch and ripping it to the proper width. I'm using a dado blade on the table saw to cut the ship lap. Since I'm cutting the dado right against the edge of the workpiece, I've shimmed out my fence on the table saw with a piece of scrap. The key to doing shiplap is just to keep up with which way you need to flip and rotate it each time that you run it through the table saw. I'm setting up the Castle 100 to cut pockets in half inch material. Now I could make these adjustments internally on the machine, but it's a whole lot easier just to shim the workpiece. This is a piece of cabinet skin. It's about an eighth of an inch thick and it works perfectly. I'm cutting evenly spaced pockets on the end pieces of the shiplap and that's how I'm going to attach the entire assembly to the back of the cabinet. One of the benefits that I got out of attaching everything this way is I had a little bit of a bow in the sides of the cabinet and the screws were able to pull that bow back into place and straighten everything up. To further strengthen up the cabinet, I countersunk screws in the top and bottom of each piece of shiplap. I use a dime between each piece to get the perfect spacing. I pin nail the corners to hold everything in place and then just repeat the process with the screws. And then I come back in and put a pin nail in the middle. Here I've continued to work my way across, but now I'm going out of sequence and I'm going to install this end piece. The reason is because, although I felt like my cuts were reasonably accurate, I knew that I would probably have to cheat the spacing on that remaining piece of shiplap.
as it turns out, I was really close and the spacing was almost perfect. To create the top piece, I use a 45 degree chamfer bit and I run the end grain first so that I can clean up any blowout when I go down the side. This chamfer bit made a really nice profile. This top piece gets screwed on, so I use a Forstner bit to drill some pockets to conceal the screw. And then I cut some plugs that will go in that pocket. I put some glue in the pockets and then I just tap the plugs in place. After the glue dries, I just cut the excess off with a flat saw and then I sand them flush. I sprayed everything, including the bars on the doors, with a clear semi-gloss lacquer. At this point, I can go ahead and start installing the hardware. I start with the hinges. I'm using a self-centering hinge bit that drills a perfect hole every time. Just a few more finishing touches and the cabinet will be done.